Good morning. It's good to be back. We were gone for a couple of weeks. Um, as Aaron shared last week, we were uh, on an adventure to California to, um, to take our daughter to college, and we're all doing better than I thought we would be, so that's awesome. Not that I thought we'd be doing awful, but woo, I mean, this is a hard thing to do, isn't it, parents who've uh, launched their children out of their home? It's not a thing to take lightly, so Brian, Allie, enjoy the days. What do they say? The days are long and the years are short. I believe it. I believe it. So I'm so glad as an Oasis Church family, we get to like come alongside one another and our kids, you know? Um, and I said, and Liam, we love you. I just want you to know that we love you. Yeah. Uh, let's pray, shall we? Thank you, God, for um, this team. What a strong team, God, you've assembled um, who are willing to, you know, do the hard work and, and work together and think together hard about troubleshooting challenges. Um, but even in, like, all of life, way beyond Sunday mornings, um, God, you call us to walk alongside one another and help each other. Um, today we ask for your blessing on all of the kids of Oasis Church and the, and the grandkids. God, thank you for them. Bless them. Encourage them. Help them know their value, God. Um, help them to be, if they're not here with us, help them be connected into community that draws, peop draws them and others closer to you. And this morning, God, would you use this message to, to sharpen us? Would you use this um, message, your word, God, um, as we go to it, to help us see things we haven't yet seen? Would you speak into our lives like you're so good at doing, God, so that we can be refreshed and renewed and encouraged and made new because of the power of your Holy Spirit? Please, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I have to say, last week and the week before, too, with Mark uh, Vanderteig preaching two weeks ago and Aaron bringing the message last Sunday and um, being far away that day and tuning in and, and seeing this team, like, work together and go with, what was it, Plan D, E, whatever it was, um, and flex, I just was, like, I love this church family, and I... I love it. What God did last Sunday um, through the team needing to, and Glenn wasn't here either, so uh, Tara wasn't here, so the two sort of mainstays on our technology, and yet they were dealing, did you mention this? I stepped out to greet some people. You mentioned the power outage. They didn't even realize what they were dealing with, and yet the Holy Spirit goes beyond a power outage. Amen? <laughs> and I felt that so much as I listened to Aaron's message. Um, God used you in powerful ways, Aaron, has gifted you, and um, what a strengthening it was. And I was like, oh, man, that was so great um, to, to be reminded of God's goodness and our mindset and his interest in walking in the midst of real life with us. Uh, I was encouraged, and now today we're starting a new um, sermon series, message series, you know, like kind of a few weeks together that are connected so that we can dwell on the things of God. And this morning, the new series that we're launching, and we have a really cool like art piece that illustrates that beautifully. Uh, we can't see it at the moment, but next Sunday. The anchor of hope. The anchor of hope. And since I started thinking about this, I am seeing anchors everywhere. I put on my wristband for William Stecker. He's uh, one of ours. And he's serving the military. There are two anchors here on, uh, on this bracelet. You will start to see anchors where you had no idea. We have some soap at home. We have an anchor on our soap. It's like some kind of marine-ish smell. I mean, it's good, though. But anyway, not like the branch of the military, but, you know, a seaside mimosa or something, I think it's called. It's got an anchor on that. I mean, we've had that on our counter in our bathroom for I don't know how long. I want you to start noticing anchors because they are everywhere, but the anchor. The anchor is God himself. And so I want to start with a story. Um, some years back on my sister's 20th birthday, she went on a mission trip. 
She went to a really difficult place to go to uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, to St. Croix, really hard. No, I, there are significant needs anywhere we go, right? Here in Cedar Rapids, we are missionaries. Anyway, she was on a mission trip, and one of the days they had kind of a free day, and they went to the ocean, and uh, they got those pool noodles, um, you know, that you can float with, and she and some friends um, were floating out in the ocean and talking and having a good time, and all of a sudden they realized they were a very, very long way from shore. J- just in the conversation they were having, they just didn't realize where they were, where they were that they had um, that they had gotten way way out, way out too far. Uh, yeah, if you want to turn to the screen for the... Can online people see this too? They can. This is the art piece. Um, the Anchor of Hope, our sermon series. You can see that, that, that boat and then the storm that's on its way. All right, we're talking about the Anchor of Hope that is, that is God himself. Um, so anyway, she and these friends realized, whoa, what? As they looked back t- to shore... And they also realized that the waves where they were at were increasingly bigger. So they start there like trying (laughs) to get back to shore. And Lisa said she she was really afraid. Like she was picturing helicopters, you know, need a helicopter needing to come. But would anybody even know that they were out there? I mean, it was it was not like a day at the beach, oh shoot, we should head back. It's scary at this point and they are working so hard to swim back and swim back and as they were getting closer actually they were being pulled by the current toward this area of the shore that was very rocky so then all of a sudden here now they're they're not just worried about their exhaustion to get back but now they're concerned that they're going to be washed up against these sharp rocks and her and her friend Katie two of the girls got back to the to the beach, but a couple of the girls actually ended up in that rocky shore, got cut, and thankfully all were okay. But an anchor can be really important. And even more so, the waves of life can cause us to be very far away, sometimes without us even realizing it. And so this morning I want to start out by having you share with me, what are some of the storms? Because a storm certainly Um, or other factors can cause us to get very far away from the shore. And so I'm just curious if we could list some things in the world. Okay, this is big picture. In a minute, we're going to talk about our lives. But big picture, what are the storms in our world, present and future, that can kind of move us out and far away from from the shore? What are some things? I'll just write those up here. Illness, yeah, so... This is in the world. What, what can get us far away? Okay, illness. Yeah, absolutely. Pandemic, right, has been disorienting. What else? What are some other realities of our world that can get us? Starvation. Thank you. Yeah. And when it's far away from us, we can kind of forget the reality, but losing a job. What else? What was the first word? Personal or corporate, like a group of people. Yeah, okay. Trauma, ooh. Okay, what else? Yes, yes, lots of loved ones. How about political differences, huh? Um, Political differences, yeah, political, yes. War. There's a lot of things that can cause, if we're the boat, or even our, our world is, get, you know, or the people are the boat, we can get far away. Lisa was on floater, floaty kind of things, right? But if we were a boat together, all of a sudden we're really offshore. We're really far away from 
from where we need to be, to be safe, right, to, to have what we need. Okay, how about personally? There's a little bit. Illnessness. That's an interesting way to <laughs> spell that. Okay, anyway, moving on. New things, here we go. Um, personally, I heard the loss of loved ones, right? So death is something that um, for us personally can uh, be really disorienting, can get us off track, right? Obviously hurting, even, even the loss of a pet, right? I mean, a part of our family. What are some other things that can cause us to get far away from the best place to be personally? Uh, busyness. Addiction, thank you. Yeah, financial. Loss of, loss of relationships, yep. Yeah, temptation. What was it? Pleasure. Pleasure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, when things are easy. Easiness. Not easiness, ness, by the way. <laughs> what else? Anything? How about a couple other things? Uh, greed. greed. Yep. Oh, jealousy. If, uh, if God is, you know, has, what was it, change? Oh, yeah. Yeah, everything's, um, everything's fine as long as it doesn't change. And then we're not happy with what is, right? So then we're kind of not happy any place. Um, when I think about that analogy of the, of the shore line and the waves that can take a boat far away, or a person, even drifting, we can go a long distance. These are certainly things that can cause us to get far away. Or when the shore is very rocky, right? Ooh, sorry about the art here. The ship is also at risk of coming up against these things that can really cause damage. Even Paul in the New Testament, he has a story about being in a shipwreck. And they're so afraid because it's been like days since they've even hardly seen the light of day. The, the storm has just been so vicious for them that they put down four anchors and they just pray until morning that they don't have a shipwreck because they don't know exactly where they're at, right? It can be very disorienting, these things, very disorienting to us. Well, um, when the storms uh, are around us, what do we need? We need an anchor particularly in a situation where the shore is rocky and things are unexpected and we don't know what's next and we're concerned about our well-being. We need an anchor. Why? Because an anchor is what, oh, I guess it probably goes to the ring here, huh? Um, you can't probably see this, sorry. I actually have this uh, from our home. And this is... Uh, Part of the passage that we're going to be, can you see that, Glenn? Um, okay. We have this anchor, this hope that's an anchor for the soul, firm and secure from Hebrews 6.19. And that's part of the passage that we're going to be um, dwelling on in the next couple of weeks. And I love that picture of the anchor that causes us to not continue to drift far away and also protects us from the realities that could really cause disaster and difficulty. The anchor of hope is God himself. Well, I was inspired on this topic um, a few weeks back when we as a family went to family camp at Okoboji, um, Okoboji Lutheran Bible Camp. And the whole theme of the, uh, the, the whole summer was anchored in hope. Do I have that right? I think that's right. So we, we're changing this a little bit. The anchor of hope. But I was really inspired. And, um, and some of the 
some, some aspects of this sermon series are going to be inspired by the speaker that we had that week, which is my brother-in-law, Nathan Annenson. And um, God really used that, those topics each day to um, help and encourage me, sharpen me, help me. And um, I believe that we can be strengthened by, the, by looking at who God is as the anchor of our hope now and in the future, now and in the future. So I would love for you, if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6. It's in the way back of the Bible. Now, while you're turning there, Glenn, can you clarify for me? So I'm seeing uh, the screen on the back, and people online are also seeing it. So I will take that, that back. Thank you very much. And uh, you folks in person, I don't know, um, It'll be just fine. Don't worry about turning around, but it will be helpful for me nonetheless. So uh, Hebrews 6, I do have that on the screen back there, so if you need reference to it as you're turning there. Hebrews 6, 13 through 19. The writer of Hebrews um, is reminding his readers about a promise that God made, a really important promise in history with a guy named Abraham way back in the Old Testament. And God chose Abraham, not because Abraham was special, not because Abraham loved God really, really well. He chose Abraham because God's good at choosing. And God chose Abraham. And he promised to Abraham, Abraham, you are going to have more descendants than there are um, uh, pieces of sand in the world. I mean, what? And Abraham, uh, through the realities of life, uh, he struggled um, they even, like, they struggled to have kids, he and his wife, Sarah. And he was of old age when God made this promise. And God, uh, have you ever, like, have you ever, I'm not going to ask you if you've ever sworn. Um, <laughs> do you know what it means to swear by something? I swear, you might say, right? Or uh, occasionally, uh, if you watch a reality show and they're needing to make promises to one another, they say, I, I swear by my children or something. It's just this crazy promise. And then when they break that, it's like, do you have no soul? You know, (laughs) that you would swear by something and then take it back. So actually, that talks about this. Hebrews 6, starting with verse uh, 13, uh, says this. I got to find it here in my Bible. For when God made a promise to Abraham, Since God had no one greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself. He made an oath on his name, okay, saying this. God said this to Abraham, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited, eventually obtained the promise that God made. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes an oath is final for confirmation. But when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, God guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, what are the two unchangeable things? Him, himself, and second, his word. When God says something, he doesn't change it. When he makes a promise, he follows through on it. He doesn't swear by anything and then change his mind. He doesn't swear by anything and then like, you know, whatever. Forget about it. Go against it. So it it says for um, that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge in him might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope. In in, uh, the NIV, a different version, this is ESV, I use ESV a lot. It says, we who have fled 
to take hold of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. I think we might need to be greatly encouraged. Lisa, when she was afloat at sea, needed encouragement. And I'm guessing, I'm hoping they were encouraging each other. We could do this. Let's go. Here, that's the thing from God. We need this encouragement. The NIV says, we who have fled to take hope of the hope set before us may be greatly encouraged. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. When we, when we are connected to the anchor that is God, that is a firm and secure hold, a firm and secure place of refuge, of strength, of what we need. Bless you. We can flee to the hope of God in the midst of the realities of life as a world and as individuals, we are invited to, t- to be tethered to an anchor that is so firm and so secure in the midst of anything we can have hope, both now and for the future. So who or what is the anchor of hope in your life? What is it that you've been sort of tethered to, connected to, that you've relied upon and maybe has kind of, uh, well hasn't really cut it. If God is firm and secure, what what are the things that we've sort of connected ourselves to that we thought wouldn't let us down, and they have? Well, I want to encourage us to, in a brand new way today, anchor ourselves anew in one who is dependable, in one who is unchanging, in one who is the promise giver and the promise keeper every single time to connect ourselves to the anchor of hope, who is God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I love the picture of the anchor. And maybe I need to, uh, let's see. I don't know that you can see this all that well. What God says um, in the midst of the realities of life is that don't tether yourselves to, uh, how about this? I should have brought an eraser, but this works just fine. It'll be fine. All right, well, let's, let's just get rid of all of that. <laughs> okay, now we're ready. All right, we are afloat at sea where this boat, okay, I can't do anything but a sailboat, but I'm sure there's something much more substantial. Our lives are important, okay? And we have this opportunity to go a whole lot of directions. And then when the waves come and, the, and, and we're either pushed toward the rocky shore or we're pushed out to sea and we're listless, isn't that the word? Um, without an anchor. And so when there's a need, we are um, invited to throw down an anchor. All right. Well, actually, the beautiful thing is that in the midst of our lostness as a world, we have a God, God the Father, who threw down an anchor. You all are messed up. You need help. You're stuck in your sin. You've got conflict. You're lost because of your sin. You're not, you're, you're, you're not able to live up to the standard of perfection that is God. You need help. And so he sent his one and only son, Jesus. And he sent Jesus because we need help so much. I don't quite understand all the things about the anchor yet, but we we will. Anchors are often shaped like this. In fact, maybe I'll blow it up here. This is the, uh, this is the uh, zoomed in version here, okay? You've seen this kind of look of an anchor. I love this, okay? Because God sent Jesus. And as you look at an anchor, I might encourage you to think of this lower part of the anchor almost like a cradle, God sent his son, his only son, to the earth in in the form of a a, a person, a baby, and in just a couple of months, because it's going to come quick, we are going to celebrate the birth of this baby, Jesus. And then he lived, he lived a life among people to connect them, right, to the anchor. And he lived life. And then he paid an ultimate price on the cross for our benefit. But he did not stay dead. He did not stay dead. In fact, I think this kind of looks to me like an empty grave. He came, he lived, 
he died and he rose again victorious, the anchor for our souls, an anchor of hope even in the midst of the death of a loved one or loved ones. Even in the midst of illness and poverty and starvation, Jesus is the answer, the anchor of our hope. And then there's this beautiful connection that he makes because it's not just Jesus doing that. He does that for our benefit, for our help, for our salvation itself. And so I think about, I'm sure it's more of a chain, right? And the strength of this chain I was reading about anchors is critical for the dependability of the anchor to do its job. Jesus connects himself to us. And then there's this point where we can say, well, we want to be connected to the anchor or we just want to keep going listlessly away. And so there's this place, this connection point. And the Holy Spirit desires to be the one to make the connection. That we would know and depend on the anchor of hope that is God himself. That's God himself. So how do we connect with him? Well, again, if you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Mark is one of the Gospels. And, uh, and Mark chapter 1, the very beginning of it, is a really important part in the story. So Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 16. I mentioned a few weeks ago when we were talking about taste and see that the Lord is good. Remember we tasted some honey? You remember this? And I mentioned to you that um, it used to be that when, when young, actually it was young boys who were being trained um, or considered to be future rabbis, they would learn the word of God and um, their teachers would put honey have them taste honey, and they would help them connect with the Old Testament scripture about how God's word is like honey. It's sweet. It's a, it's, it's a delight, and that we're to taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, back in Jesus' day, as I was mentioning, there was a very intentional training process for young boys. Liam, how old are you? Can you remind me how old you Seven years old. Listen to this, Liam. When... when um, when back in Jesus' day and before that, boys like you who were seven years old, actually starting at the age of six, started a school, and it was called Bet Sefer. So starting at the age of six, there would be a local teacher of the Torah. Okay, that's the Bible, the first five books of the Bible. Okay, um, let's see. Let's just look at this quick. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, that's number two, right? Leviticus, number three, Numbers, number four, and Deuteronomy. Okay, stay with me here. So starting at the age of six years old, a little younger than you, Liam, this first part of the Bible was starting to be taught, the Torah, and not just taught, but memorized, Liam. All of this. Come here a second, could you? Yeah, Isaiah, you can come up too, because, hey, this would be you in a couple of years. Okay. You would be expected to memorize all of these words, this whole section. All right? That's a lot to memorize. Now, you have actually memorized a lot in your life. I bet you know some um, movie lines. Yeah? You know some characters, Marvel characters, right? Um, you probably could recite some TV shows that you've seen and maybe some song lyrics that you like, right? But this is a lot to memorize. I mean, if you think math is hard, I can only imagine. I don't think I could do this. Okay, you can go back to your seat. Thank you. Now, that's um, starting at age six. Between six and age 10, Liam, so that's you in three years, you would need to have had this memorized. Now, if you had that memorized, then you could go to the next grade, essentially. You could move up to the next grade, a different kind of class called Bet Talmud. And this class was for 10 to 14-year-olds, okay? Now, you would have already had this memorized, Okay, but then between 10 and 14, um, if you'd had it memorized, the best would keep going and you would memorize the rest of Hebrew scripture. That's all the way to Matthew in the New Testament. Wait, where's that? Oh, I'm still going back. It's a lot. And you would have, now you probably wouldn't have as many distractions in life, okay? I will say that. TV maybe would take up less time. 
uh, social media, hopefully by 14, you're still not even into that. But you would have that expectation to have memorized the rest of the Hebrew scriptures. It blows my mind. Now, if you've done that, and you're making the grade, okay? You're like being able to engage in the conversations and be challenged by the rabbi. At 14 years old, a rabbi, the most respected person in the community, and this was a dream for every child. You kind of picture kids who want to be NFL football players. They've worked really hard to keep moving toward the direction of being a rabbi. Okay, so if you get to that point and that dream is realized, a rabbi would ask you to follow them. You'd have to pass tests. You'd have to make the mark. You'd have to be exceptional in your memorization of all of the Hebrew scriptures. And if that was the case, then you would be asked. Now, a rabbi would ask this question of themselves. Does this student have what it takes to be like me? And, and not like in an arrogant way, okay? But they had also been schooled and equipped, and, and, and equipped to, to be a rabbi. Does this student have what it takes to be like me? And if the answer was yes, then the rabbi would say, come and follow me. Those were really important words. Come and follow me. It was like the dream of every young man was to hear those words. Come, come and follow me. Then the new disciple would leave everything and devote his entire life to becoming like their rabbi. All right? This picture of even being covered in the dust of the rabbi, that they would be following the rabbi so closely learning from them, aiming to be like them, that they would even have the dust of the rabbi on them. That was the hope. That was the aim. That's what they had been working so hard for. Well, what if you didn't make the cut? What if you'd been working so hard? Well, they would say, it's a no. Go back to your family and learn their trade. It's not a no just for now. It's a, it's a no. Go back with your family and learn your family's trade. Well, here we are in Mark chapter 1. Jesus, Jesus is uh, just starting his ministry. And in Mark chapter 1, starting with verse 16, listen to what's going on. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, um, sorry, let me try that again. He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Now, if they're fishermen, they've returned to the family's trade. They didn't make the cut on the rabbi thing. They didn't pass. They didn't make muster. Is that the phrase? Do I have that wrong a little bit? They didn't quite measure up, and they were sent back to learn their family's trade. So Jesus is walking along. He sees these two brothers. They're casting a net into the sea for their fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, Jesus saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. Again, two guys who had to go back to the family business. Plan B. And immediately Jesus called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Like for a long time I thought, poor Zebedee, I mean... You know, you're not even going to, like, say goodbye. No, I mean, they just, like, immediately leave. And then you put it in the context of what they had grown up with. What were, what were Zebedee's hopes for his sons, right? Or what had their, his sons worked so hard to get, and then their hopes were dashed? No, Zebedee's like, absolutely go. In fact, the boys didn't have to wonder. Come and follow me. A rabbi is calling you. I thought my chances were like done. And here's Jesus himself. Come and follow me. And so, of course, they drop the nets. They 
say see ya, dad. And they're on their way because, and in fact, by the way, uh, parents, we have quite a few who are parents of high schoolers, of college students, um, even very recently, right, have said, go on your way. You go after it. Go get it. Go pursue your dreams. Go spread your wings. We're like Zebedee. You've been called. Go. It's not necessarily easy for us, but go. Because that's what God's been doing your whole life, is preparing you for what's next. When the rabbi says, come and follow me, we as parents can say, go. You do that. Yes, it's personal to me. But our rabbi does the same thing for us. Come, follow me. And I will make you fishers of men. You think what you've got right now is decent? I'm going to blow your mind. I've got such good things for you. You are not the B team or the C team. You are not the castaways. You are not the left behinds, the forgottens. God has called you, men, women, and children, all of us, <laughs> to come and follow him. Yes, Lord, I will go. I have been waiting for this invitation from you. I will go. Jesus says in John, you did not choose me. I chose you. So when it comes to being tethered to the anchor that is God, the Holy Spirit's doing something important in us right now. He's doing something important in Oasis Church. He's connecting us in new ways to the anchor that is God the Father God the Son, and the, God the Holy Spirit. The anchor, firm and secure. A couple of weeks ago, you received an invitation. It was an invitation to taste and see that the Lord is good. And I don't know if you got that, if you received the RS, I mean, you received it, those of you who are in person or online. Did you RSVP? And there was a section here, uh, and this was a tasting experience, right? Taste and see what the, that the Lord is good. Taste and see no later than, and I don't know what date you put in there. Maybe it was right then. I'm ready to taste and see, Lord, that you are good. By way of what? Well, there are things called spiritual disciplines, and spiritual disciplines are ways for us to connect to the anchor that is God. And over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about what that looks like, practically speaking. Not just, um, Jody, yes, it's a good idea to connect to God, but how, in what way, what are some steps that I can take so that I am connected to this one who is firm and secure in the midst of any storm of life? And we're going to get after that together. Now, shockingly, I just looked at the clock, just like Aaron last week. <laughs> <laughs> we're like, we're not doing music. Um, maybe we'll be done with the worship service early. No, it's 1022. And I'm like, I'm still going here. Um, but God, there's more for us, okay, in the next few weeks. And uh, Aaron, that was your experience last week too, right? Because once we get going about the goodness of God, it's kind of hard to stop. But this week, I want to invite you to allow yourself to be tethered, connected to the anchor that is God in whatever you're experiencing. And then let's think about intentionally how we can grow in, in our spiritual disciplines, like healthy disciplines, like brush your teeth because it keeps your teeth healthy. How can we keep sharpened? How can we keep healthy in regard to our relationship with God? I want to introduce you or challenge you with some spiritual disciplines that will help us be all the more connected to the anchor. Now, when we get disconnected, taste and see that the Lord is good. He loves to invite us back into that connection. So if that's you, if you feel like, man, I realize just now I've been listless. I've kind of been, you know, uh, allowing the, the waves, the wind to take me away from, from following Jesus. Come follow me, he says. Come and follow me. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for the invitation to follow you. You have chosen us. You've chosen us. And you say, come and follow me. Because in you is abundant life. In you is hope. In you is truth in the midst of the, un, uh, the, 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 the lies of, of life. 
in you is grace. Oh, we need your grace. Thank you for the offer to be the anchor of our souls, firm and secure, a refuge for us in time of need. Coach us, Lord, in these weeks ahead, in these spiritual disciplines. Help us to grow closer to you. But thank you, Lord, that you're the initiator of that connection. Thank you that you are the champion for our relationship with you. Thank you that you choose us, as you said to your disciples, we don't choose you, you chose us. Thanks for the adventure you've called us into. Lead us in it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand and uh, receive the blessing? Well, let we receive it, by the way, every week. It's not me. It's, uh, it's God giving it to us. May the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine on you, and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look with favor on you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. God bless you. Online people, thank you for joining us. If you're in the Cedar Rapids area, join us next Sunday. And uh, let's continue to go together connected to the anchor of our soul. God bless.